All right. Thanks, Zucky. Thanks, everyone. So here we are about to talk about the future of France, and all these losers just left the room, so they're going to miss out. But lucky for you guys. Uh, so yeah, so I'm, I'm Ethan. Uh, if, if you follow me or know anything about me, you know I'm really into money, monetary design, trying to figure this stuff all out. Um, <clears throat> when I told Nick, <coughs> uh, so we've been, <coughs> excuse me, we've been working on a new project that we call collaborative finance or CoFi. It's our response to DeFi. When I told Nick I want to talk about CoFi, he said, "Well, that's not really on topic. You should talk about something else." So I just changed the title to Modularity and Monetary Design, and of course he was then thrilled. Now the thing, the thing Nick probably didn't even un understand was that CoFi really is about a modular payment system design based on a system of intents over which we optimize with graph solvers that publish ZK proofs of integrity. So if that's not on topic, then what is, right? All right. You know, I've long felt that money is the killer app. Uh, it's the ultimate multi-stakeholder computational use case. Uh, and yet we failed to have the impact we'd all like to have, right? So I believe what's on the next slide uh, is a quote from me that says, if home is where the heart is, money is where the payments are. Uh, because that's what I think money is for. Money is, money is for payments. And we can talk about the modular structure of money, right? Everyone's familiar with the three functions of money. Uh, the unit of account is for denominating debt. The medium of exchange is for discharging debt here and now. And the store of value is for discharging debt elsewhere or later. It's a very clear formulation. It'd be great if we had such a clear uh, statement of the modular functions of, of blockchains. What I'd like to point out is that... Oh, I wish I had to... What I'd like to point out is that between these different modular functions are tensions, right? And, and when, we're, when we're building modular systems and modular designs, part of what, what they do is they allow us to focus in on the tensions between the different functions. So it's not enough to just say, okay, these pieces are modular, and so we've got this modular thing over here and, and, and that over there. There's real tensions between the functions that we need to tune to. And so I call the tension between the unit of account and the medium of exchange liquidity, which is what, much of what we're going to talk about um, today. And the other, I'm writing a blog series about all this, so you, you can check it out. Uh, but I won't go into it because I'm probably going to be running out of time. All right, I, I believe the, the next slide <coughs> says something like, okay, armed with a unit of account, we can denominate unlimited structures of liability, right? I can say you owe me, you owe whoever, right? We, we can denominate all this debt. But then the problem is, how do we ensure that we can actually discharge it all, right? You go, you create all this debt structure, and then how are you going to discharge it all? This is, the, this is the fundamental problem of the banking system, of money, of payments, of finance, that all this stuff is sort of, is sort of built on top of, right? And next slide. Um, <laughs> it's a good thing I actually practice. Uh, uh, so we call this problem liquidity, right? The ability to ensure that you can actually discharge your debts, that's what liquidity means. Liquidity is not how much slippage you're going to have when you trade one shit coin for another, right? It's not, uh, you know, how many assets are available on, on some AMM. We call that liquidity because the purpose of trading is to acquire an asset so that you can discharge a debt, right? If all you're doing is trading just, you know, to, uh, to trade monkey pictures or, or, to, or to see your, the value of your assets go up, well, you're not doing anything real in, in the real world. The whole point of exchange and everything we're building ultimately needs to be in service of discharging debt because that's where we, that's where we ground ourselves in the real world and real trust relationships and, 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 and so on, right? So we need, to, we need to keep that in mind. Now, next slide. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the way we solve or address the liquidity problem Hey! Woo -hoo! Oh, look, they're so pretty, right? Here we go. So we did this slide. We did this slide. Just dwell on that. Meditate on this for a while, okay? This is, this is, this is pretty fundamental stuff, yeah? Um, we did this slide. We are here. Okay. So what's a payment system? We define a payment system as a set of obligations, right? These are the debts plus a liquidity source we can use to discharge those obligations, right? Now, if you think about that definition for a minute, you might be like, well, wait a minute. All these things I call payment systems, you know, fintech, banking, blockchains, all of them are just about the liquidity source. They're just about moving assets around. None of them actually do anything to represent the obligations, right? So none of them are actually satisfying this definition of a payment system, which is a problem, because if we're going to build the next generation of payment systems, we need to address this. Okay, so let me, let me briefly give you a critique of, of existing payment systems. Now, we're working on a white paper for this Ko-Fi stuff. That's really what I'm presenting here. Um, that, that'll be coming out in the next, uh, you know, two weeks TM. But, uh, you know, so, so first of all, we'll cover this very, very quickly. None of these payment systems are designed from first principles. They're all just, like, cobbled together over the years, responding to, you know, various problems. 
Um, it's all just about asset transfer and exchange, but there's so much more to, to the core problem of, of, of payments and, and finance and, and what we're doing than asset transfer and exchange. We have to actually look at the underlying obligations. Now, when we're talking about exchange, so much of exchange today, both in, in the banking system and in the real world, uh, uh, sorry, in, <laughs> in the banking system and in the blockchain world, it's all about market making and dealers. That's, that's what everyone's trying to do, bring dealers on board, you know, AMMs, liquidity, all this stuff. That is a new model that developed after the collapse of the banking system in the 16th century. Now, I promised Thibault I wouldn't talk about the 16th century today, so I'm not going to. If you think that's great, like, oh, great, he's not going to talk about history, you're part of the problem uh, because we all need to learn a little bit more history. And fundamentally, if we're responding to this issue of central banks, we all think, oh, you know, we're going after central banks. Central banks emerged in response to the collapse of a prior international banking system that ran in the 16th century that cleared all the trade credit in Europe without almost any money at all. We need to understand that. We need to understand what happened, why it failed, and how central banks emerged out of that chaos uh, to lead us from a world of clearing to a world of liquidity providing, right? Basically, since then, society has been structurally short volatility. All these dealers, all these market makers, they're short volatility. That is not a way to set yourself up for sustainability. It's a way to compound moral hazard at the heart of the system, yeah? So obviously, they constantly fail because nature is not short volatility, right? And so at some point, you blow up, and what happens? Central bank shows up, prints a bunch of money, bails you out, right? So that leads us to the fourth problem, which is, or the, the fourth element of the critique, which is the problem of issuance. Any payment system needs to grapple with the problem of issuance, whether you're a blockchain, you know, issuing to miners, uh, whether you're, you know, a new currency like, uh, like Osmosis, issuing to, uh, issuing to liquidity providers, or whether you're a central bank in a banking system doing issuance when you make loans or when you, when you bail, out, um, bail out the whole system. And so what we want to do is try to understand issuance in terms of the underlying obligations, right? One way to think about it is that, hey, when a, when a Bitcoin miner does some proof of work, right, they have shipped a service to the blockchain, and now the blockchain owes them. The blockchain has a debt to that miner, which it then discharges by issuing new Bitcoin. Right? And so by thinking that way kind of opens up new possibilities for thinking about the problem of issuance. We think that's important because fundamentally we're, we're, we're going after two questions here. Right? One is, how do we design a payment system to optimally discharge debt? And two is, who should have the right to issue and according to what principles, right? Now, a lot of people in the blockchain space are focused on, on problem two, and there's a lot of you know, concern around tokenomics and issuance and, and how we do all this stuff, but there's almost no concern at all with option one. No one's talking about how we discharge debt, right? Now, hopefully, we can start to change that. Hopefully, you don't walk out of here being like, oh, he's crazy, none of that matters, and you're like, you know, I need to focus on this debt discharging problem and issuance in that context, because right now, who controls the issuance in the world? It's the banks when they make loans, they issue new money, and it's the central banks when they bail out the banks, they issue, you know, the, the base money. What we want to do is restore the capacity to issuance to individual communities, right? And we need, to, in, in order to do that and do that responsibly and sustainably, we need to ground it in the actual network structure of debts. Okay, this leads us to uh, ultimately to what we're building, which we call collaborative finance. And, and collaborative finance we think of as a sort of semi-permeable membrane between the real economy and the financial economy. It's that, it's that layer in the middle, the yellow. MTCS is our, is, is our core algorithm, multilateral trade credit set off. Of course, that's a, that's a, a well-designed marketing term that users are going to love. Um, but, but the whole idea is that we can protect people in the real economy in the bottom layer by focusing on the, on the structure of credit and obligations, but we can still connect into the larger capitalist system, you know, so we don't have to overthrow everything at once. We can sort of, you know, do this iteratively. We can build a platform that allows lenders and, and capital providers, liquidity providers, you know, lending protocols, et cetera, to plug in, but still do it in a way that, that's responsible and takes care of the real economy, right? And, and, and that's really what, what Copa is all about and what we're building. Okay, so let's, uh, let's actually talk about the design of the system. This is the, the background, even though I didn't talk too much about history. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to briefly just talk about the missing primitive, right? The, the main missing primitive is the obligation, right? The, the debt, okay? And we're going to use balance sheets here. Uh, the world would be a better place if everyone spent a little bit more time learning accounting and, and thinking about balance sheets. So we're going to do some very basic uh, accounting here on stage. So on the left, we have Alice and Bob. We have their balance sheets, assets and liabilities, right? Not very complicated. This is a simple asset transfer, right? Alice has $20 in assets. She transfers it to Bob. Now Bob has the assets. There's no liabilities involved. There's, there, there's nothing happening. This is, this is what you do every time you send a payment to someone else, right? Uh, on the right, we have what an obligation looks like, right? So now there's a liability involved. Alice is declaring that she owes Bob, right? So she has a $20 liability to Bob, and that corresponds on Bob's balance sheet to an asset, right? We might call this, if you, if you manage books at a company, accounts payable, accounts receivable, very simple stuff, right? The reason I'm pointing this out is because we can, we're gonna build much more complicated structures that are networking these, these different obligations together. But, but there's two things I wanna, I wanna highlight here. One is, when you do an asset transfer between two parties, right, from Alice to Bob. 
in general, we can say that is in service of discharging a pre-existing debt, right? You're not, I mean, okay, it might be a gift, but almost, almost every time, Alice already owes Bob money, and that's the reason she's gonna send him the $20, right? Now, we're not representing that liability here. We don't represent it on our blockchains, but that's exactly what we're missing, right? And that's the whole point of, of what we're trying to do, to bring those obligations on chain so that we can do something more constructive with them. The other thing I wanna point out is that declaring an obligation, what we're doing on the right in, in, in part B, is really a permissionless action. It's very much like sending money. You know, I can send Gary Gensler some shit coins and there's nothing he can do about it if I have his address. I can also declare that I owe him money and there's nothing he can do about it. If I say I owe Gary money, then who is he to stop me, right? So it's a sort of permissionless declaration. Uh, it is an intent, if you will, to pay, okay? So now we have these obligations, we put them together into a larger network and you get you know, complicated structures. You got single obligations, chain cycles. If you've seen anything about Kofi, if you're thinking about this to yourself, you're like, hey, wait a minute, if I can see the obligations and there's obligations in a cycle, then we can clear any obligations that are in a cycle. Right, and you can do that without any money at all. I owe Gary, and Gary owes, I don't know, Janet Yellen, and Janet Yellen owes me, and we can just get together and say, hey, we all owe each other, let's just do set off, right? We don't need, we don't need any money, we can just do set off. And that's what's possible when you start to uh, open up the structure of the obligation network, and you look at the obligations, you can actually save everyone cash flow, liquidity, you can clear more debt with less money. That's what this is all about, yeah? Okay, so once you have all these obligations, how do you actually discharge them? And, and generally speaking, there are four ways to discharge or, or to settle obligations, right? Almost all of modern finance is built on the fourth one. It's called novation. It's when you actually change the structure of the payments graph, right? You do securitization or factoring or clearing houses. You, you introduce intermediaries. You sell your debt. You factor your debt, right? All of this, you know, the, the economists claim this is all in service of like reducing risk and making things more efficient. Obviously, all of that was, uh, was bullshit. Uh, and we saw that very clearly in 2008 when, when this whole, you know, house of cards came, came tumbling down. What we want to do is as much as possible as we can using the existing structure of the payments graph before we even consider novation. And it turns out there's quite a bit you can do. You can do set off, which we just talked about. That's clearing, right? I owe you, you owe me. Let's just do set off. Or we can do it in cycles, arbitrary size. There's assignment, which is just normal transfer, we just, you know, we'll, we'll use a, a fancier word because that's what we like to do. You know, I, I transfer you money, that's assignment, it discharges a debt. But then there's a very interesting thing you can do, which we'll call overdraft, right? This is where you say draw on a credit line. Someone makes some credit line available to you and you can draw on that credit line to pay someone. So one way you can think about this is assignment is what you can do if you have a positive balance, right? You have a positive balance of some asset, you can assign some of those assets to someone else and use that to discharge debt. Overdraft is what you can do if you have access to a negative balance, right? Someone says, okay, I will allow your balance to go negative, and so your balance can go into negative territory. You can draw on that to pay someone else. This is what happens when you take out a credit line from a bank. It's basically a negative balance. It's what happens when you have a, a mutual credit system. Uh, in both of those cases, you actually have money creation happening, right? When you, when you have a credit line from a bank and you draw down on it, the bank is actually creating new money. It's expanding its balance sheet and allowing you to use that, that new money uh, to make payments. And banks are allowed to do that because they have licenses from the government, but why should they get to have all the fun, right? We want to seize the means of, of, of production of, of money back from the banks uh, for communities and, and figure out a way to do that responsibly. And that's really what this is all about. But we can also do overdraft without money creation, right? A pool of investors could come together and say, okay, we're going to pool our, our Bitcoin and our Osmo and our Atoms into some pool here. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll do it over IBC. We'll, we'll put it in this little Ko-Fi chain. And, uh, you know, we will make it available to people to draw on to pay their bills, right? And we can do it because we're going to have access access to this network structure of obligations, we can do it in a much more intelligent uh, and optimized and, and risk reduced way. So it's important to keep these, these different things in mind. The last thing would be novation. We're not going to focus on novation because we want to avoid it. We want to do as much as possible of set off, assignment, and overdraft before we hit novation. Okay, the last thing we need to put it all together is, as, as promised, uh, the system of intents, okay? So we already touched on obligations. We sort of beat them to death. Obligations are an intent to pay. That's kind of obvious, yeah? So then, to really round this out, we need tenders and acceptances. So a tender is an intent to use some liquidity to discharge your obligation. So I have access to some dollars or some Bitcoin or, or, or some atoms. I think I upset Sunny here. I didn't, uh, I didn't pump Osmo enough. <laughs> Uh, so I, I have access to some Osmo, maybe he'll stay, uh, and, and I say, you know, I'm willing to use my Osmo to discharge my debts. Wouldn't that be great, Sonny, if people could use Osmo to pay their bills? Um, and, uh, and, and, and then an acceptance is the flip side of that. It's saying, I'm willing to accept some Osmo, or I'm willing to accept some Atom 
uh, or Tia, you know, if you will, right? Right, Nick? Yeah. Uh, I'm willing to accept some Tia to discharge debts owed to me, right? That'd be great. I, I like Tia. I like Nick. I like what they're doing at the Modular Summit. Uh, and so I'm willing to accept some Tia. And, and so you can start to collect all these different intents, all the obligations, the network structure, the different tenders people are making, which means the different kinds of liquidity they're willing to use to pay their bills, the, all the acceptances, the different kinds of liquidity people are, are willing to accept in payment of their bills. And we can put it all together into a graph structure. And then we can run a solver over the whole graph. Right? And we can run solvers that, that draw on decades of, of you know, advanced theory and algorithms in graph theory, essentially, to, to find optimal results. So we can actually optimize to discharge the most amount of debt with the least amount of money while respecting everyone's preferences, right? Solving over a system of intents. You all love it. All right, so this is, this is what it ultimately looks like, right? So we represent, we have our graph here, we have a bunch of obligations. Um, we have at the bottom this VB, this is our liquidity source, right? You can imagine it's, 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 uh, it's Osmo, it's Tia, Adam, what, whatever you like. And, and we have the A on the left, that's the assignment source, and the O, that's the overdraft source, right? So those are positive and negative balances that people are able to draw on. And then on the right, we have repayment and deposit, right? That's where the money goes back to after it's, uh, it, it's sort of used, it either needs to be repaid or, or redeposited. And basically, we can use the same algorithm we use to find cycles, we can use the same algorithm with liquidity to find even more cycles, right? So the addition of liquidity into the network, even a little bit of liquidity, a small amount of tenders or a small amount of acceptances, allows us to essentially close more loops, right? So more people can benefit from their debt being discharged, okay? There's a lot to digest in this slide. You'll have to read the white paper. Uh, we'll go into a little more detail here. Here we have two different liquidity sources. We're going to put overdraft aside. We'll just focus on assignment here, right? So we have A owes B owes E. We have D owes B owes C. Right, so an obligation chain. Now, we have uh, access to fiat, we have access to crypto, and we have B. B doesn't want to use dirty fiat, he doesn't want to use shit coins, he's only willing to settle in gold bars. But he's happy to do set off, right? If, if, if you owe him and he owes you, he'll do set off with you, but he doesn't want your dirty fiat, he doesn't want your shitty crypto, he, he only wants gold. Now, what's going to happen? A has a tender that says, well, I'm willing to use fiat to pay my debts, and C has an acceptance saying, I'm willing to use fiat to, to discharge my debts. D is willing to use crypto, and, and so is E, to accept crypto. And what ends up happening is B benefits from both of these things. So B is benefiting from A and C using fiat and from D and E using crypto without even knowing about it. D doesn't want anything to do with them. He doesn't have to touch either of them. All he's going to handle is a setoff notice that says his debts are reduced, right? And his debts are being reduced because other people are using fiat and other people are using crypto, right? This opens very profound new ways to bring crypto into the real economy, where so long as there's a small number of people willing to tender crypto and accept crypto, others can benefit from that without having to touch it at all. So long as they're willing to touch a setoff notice, which is just an accounting entry, okay? So this offers you know, really, really new ways for crypto to impact the real world economy, to be used in real world payments, and to benefit real people without them even having to touch it, which is, I think, a nut that we've, we've, we haven't been able to crack uh, really until now. This is another example. Um, this one's a little bit more, more complicated, but, but also quite profound, where we were not able to close the loop within fiat or within crypto. We have to combine, see on the previous slide, you know, we didn't need both liquidity sources, right? If we just had fiat, we'd close the loop ABC. If we just had crypto, we'd close the loop DBE, right? In this slide, C, uh, in this slide, we're, we're not able to close either of those loops. We need to use both crypto and fiat together. And in this, in this system, because the difference here is basically uh, in the previous one, you know, D owed B, um, you, you can see there's sort of that not, there, there's not the same overlap, right? So here you actually need both sources of liquidity to be able to discharge everyone in the path. And so you end up to, com you're able to complete a new cycle over both sources. And so the more liquidity sources you bring in, even with a small amount of tenders and acceptances, assuming you have a large obligation graph, you're able to discharge way more debt, which is very, very, very powerful. So ultimately, you put this all together, you get something like this, right? So here's, here's uh, based on real data simulated with three different liquidity sources, we could say one of these is fiat, one of these is crypto, one of these is, is mutual credit. That's the holy grail. Mutual credit is communities being able to issue their own debt, uh, sorry, their own currency to discharge their debt, right? And you get this, this stunning visualization of, of how everything flows in the network so that all the debt, as much debt as possible, can be cleared with the least amount of money while optimizing over and respecting everyone's preferences for which currencies they actually want to use. Uh, with that, I'm perfectly on time, which is kind of amazing. Uh, thank you so much. I'm Buck Manster. You can learn more at ko-fi.informal.systems and check out the white paper when it's out.